So we're going through the book of Proverbs. Last year, uh, we went through chapter 12. Uh, kind of the vision is that three summers of Proverbs in the park. So this is the second summer of it. And then, then we'll have to rename it like Psalms in the park or something like that. Or, and then that'll be like 15 years of summer services. And it'll, we'll just go from there. But um, Pamathew in the park, maybe. Um, <laughs> Something like that. Uh, so Proverbs 13 is where we're at. Who knows what the weather, I mean, we'll, we'll kind of, we won't dilly-dally getting through it here, but um, the theme of Proverbs uh, is basically wisdom, wisdom for young men especially, just because, you know, Solomon was writing to his, his son, and he had learned wisdom from his father, David, King David, Wisdom that he did not heed or follow, you know? And so he has, uh, has some things to share of, man, if you could hear me, son, uh, this would change your life, save your life, you know? Um, and so, you know, they're kind of poems. Uh, sometimes there's little riddle type things. Um, you know, interpreting Proverbs uh, because they are um, kind of idioms, they are... Uh, Proverbs, they are wise sayings that are true most of the time, okay? Uh, it's it's kind of like the general flow of if you do this, like this, this usually happens, you know? Um, a lot of times people will quote something like, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he won't depart from it. And then, you know, life goes on, and like this kid is like an atheist, you know, and he lead some weird club on campus or something, you know? And it's like, most of the time it's true. And then there's also times it's like, I mean, the enemy's like got his hooks into this kid, you know? And so there's like, it's true most of the time. And they are promises that you can rest in and trust the Lord in. So um, how's this working? Are we getting like awesome? Oh, amazing. Can you guys hear me? Is this working? Oh, no. Oh, we forgot to hook the speakers up. Um, so... Proverbs are also interesting because um, you kind of like hop around on subjects, you know? Sometimes you're like, oh man, this is totally, this is, this is like right for me, you know? And then, it, then the next verse is like, I don't even know what he's talking about here and I don't even own a lion, you know, or something like, you know? <laughs> and so, you know, it's like, oh, a couple of verses will just be like, just that was like a word fitly spoken that's really kind of the gift of wisdom, a gift that Solomon had. It's like a word fitly spoken that really solves like the crises at the moment. In the New Testament, you read of the spiritual gift of wisdom. And it's like just a word from the Lord at that moment that just, it really solves that problem. And sometimes it's just those two verses from that Proverbs chapters. And it's just it's helpful. Um, and then I would also say, as wonderful as Solomon was in writing these, my wife, Lindsay, sometimes she's like, she's kind of uh, bummed out by Solomon. You know, if you know Solomon and what he did with his like thousand wives and 700 concubines, I'm always like, judge not, honey, you know? <laughs> and, um, but she's like, oh, I don't even want to hear it from him. And I'm like, you got to understand, like, like the Lord dealt with him and brought him to a place of repentance. If you read the end of Ecclesiastes, where he's like, I tried everything, smoked everything, went, you know, went everywhere, had all the businesses, had all the money. If you read about Solomon's life during Solomon's reign, like silver was like rocks on the ground. Like that's what Israel was like. And, and his father David said, listen to me, son. Look into my eyes, boy. Learn from me and my adulterous ways. Follow hard after the Lord. Don't follow after idols. Don't turn from the right hand to the left. And it'll be well with you. Your foot will be established. But if you compromise, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go bad, son. And it started out well for Solomon. And then by about 1 Kings 11, you start reading that uh, Solomon took a foreign wife and more foreign wives. And those wives turned his heart away from the Lord to begin worshiping idols. And I mean, all the way into like sexual immorality, um, like some of these gods required child sacrifice, like wicked, wicked stuff to the point where 
it was through Solomon's son that, that the kingdom was split. And you know about the civil war in Israel. Because Solomon didn't obey the Lord, didn't heed the voice of his father, wisdom to young men, the nation of Israel was split and divided and they were led into captivity. And it's just tragedy. So Solomon, at the end of his life, He writes Ecclesiastes and he says, I'm telling you guys, and now he's like, my son, look into my eyes, listen to me. I've been with the women, I've lived in the pleasure, I've eaten the stuff, I've went to the comedy clubs, you know, I've tried to, you know, leave an inheritance, like there's all this stuff, and I'm just telling you, listen to me, look into my eyes, fear the Lord. Fear the Lord and follow after God. And this is the sum of all of life. And he says, trust me, like don't go down the path I went down, hear me. And so it's wisdom for us too as we go through Proverbs. There's some good stuff in chapter 13 here. Um, There's stuff that, you know, I just feel the Lord being like, son, Rory, uh, remember this, remember this, you know. And I love that we have the youth here, we have the young ones here. It's like, There's that hilarious video on YouTube of the little kid and he's telling his mom, Linda, listen, Linda, listen, Linda, no, Linda. And she's like, Baba, you are spanking on your butt. You know, he's like, Mom, Linda, listen. And it's like the Lord is doing that with us. You know, he's like, Linda, listen. So if your name is Linda here tonight, you're definitely supposed to listen up, you know. But let's get into it. Uh, There's like 28, 29 verses. One. A wise son heeds his father's instructions, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. So it starts out, the context is for the son. Of course, daughters, you know, uh, children of the Lord listening to the father. But it's wisdom to, to hear and to accept your father's instructions. Now, there's a time in life when that's pretty easy. Right now, I've got Titus. And if you know Titus, he's like, just sweet and sensitive and moldable and pliable. And now I have like a 15 and a half year old who loves Jesus following after him. But I can see as he's becoming a man, I'll say things and he's like, you know, and I'm like, serious, son, serious. You know, and he's like, you know, and then he goes and facts checks it. And then it turns out I'm wrong. And it's like, oh, they didn't have Snopes back in Solomon's day. Um, but listen to the voice of your father. And it's kind of easy right now as you're young and tender. Some of you young guys and dad is so big and buff and strong. And then you start getting big and buff and strong and being able to take out your dad. And you don't want to listen to him anymore. You know better than him all of a sudden. And, you know, for me, I just remember I was 19 years old when my dad passed away. And he was my hero. And there was a little bit of times when I was like, I mean, I think I know better on this one, dad, you know, or something. But if I can just get kind of personal, I I guess. Uh, The one time that my dad was like, listen, it was when uh, I was 18, 19. And the girl that I thought I was going to marry, you know, that I was just so Twitter pated over. uh, Like broke my heart and broke up with me. And I was just, I had such an idol in my heart in her that I was just consumed. Like it was just, that was, I had, I had a few girls in high school that were idols in my life and I'd be consumed. And at the same time, I was a bachelor to the rapture. And so I was like, hey, don't worry. I'm never going to get married. I'm just going to live for Jesus. And the girls loved that. And they were like, oh, really? You know, just kidding. Um, but there was this girl that I was just like, oh, oh, I just, we were going to get married and we talked about married and I told her I loved her. Wisdom to young men, don't ever tell a girl you love her until you put a ring on it, okay? Um, and, and when I was just so just like moping around the house and oh, oh my dad just came over to me and, uh, and he sat me down. This was like three months before he had the stroke that was going to kill him. And he sat me down and he said, son, listen to me. And he said, and my dad had had a a wife before my mom and uh, my uncle told me about this (laughs) and I found out through my uncle and they had gotten an annulment and, uh, and they were married for 30 days and 
he brought her out to the ranch and she didn't want the ranch life. And so she went into town and partied and went home with other men. And within 30 days, she hadn't, she hadn't been faithful to him. And him and his cowboy brothers ran the guy off the ranch that she was with, you know, on horseback. And it was like an episode of Bonanza, by Bonanza, Oregon. And, um, and so my dad knew heartbreak and heartache. And, but then he knew the Lord's provision in my mom. And so he was just like, son, I'm just telling you, the Lord's got this. There's a, there's a woman out there for you. And just, you got to trust the Lord and just don't worry about it. Shake it off. And I just remember being like, you don't know anything. You don't know anything, dad. You know, you don't know the love that we had, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and still have. She doesn't even know it anymore, you know. And, um, and then, you know, you move on. The Lord provides. And now I have Lindsay and she's not here tonight because I don't know where she's at. But, um. <laughs> So listen to your dad. She has a migraine tonight, just in case you're wondering. Listen and heed it. Heed the instruction, the discipline, the chastisement, the training, the correction of your father. But the opposite of that is to be a scoffer. Proverbs talks a lot about a scoffer, all right? A scoffer just means chatter, you know, back talk. You know, when you play Little League and the coach is like, let's hear some chatter out there. And you're like, hey, batter, 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 you don't know, no, no, no. Like, don't do that to your dad, Brent, okay? You know, you're graduated, you're going to college. Listen to the man, okay? Um, So you've got heeding the wisdom and hearing the wisdom and obeying the wisdom or talking back and chattering and you don't know nothing, you know? That's foolish. Verse two, a man shall eat well by the fruit of his mouth, but the soul of the unfaithful feeds on violence. He who guards his mouth preserves his life, but he who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. And so there's just something about uh, guarding your mouth and guarding the words that come out and letting the Lord give you wisdom on the things that you speak. Don't just, you know, I remember last summer, how many Proverbs spoke about um, how the your mouth is like a well of water that, It has words like right up to here, right up almost an overflowing bank. And if you remember last summer, there were many Proverbs that were like, don't let that spring overflow your mouth. Like keep the words in. And uh, just this week, Sunday, I I gave two different sermons at two different churches. And I came back from both of them regretting some things that I had said, you know, for the sake of comedy or a joke or whatever. And I was just like, Oh, I hope they weren't offended. I hope that, and you're all here. So I'm like, okay, okay, okay. Um, But just like, I was like, oh Lord, just let me be slower to speak. And on those things that you're like, maybe don't. And I'll be like, but maybe do. And like, when he says maybe don't, just don't, okay. Um, But, you know, James speaks about this in the New Testament, about how, man, if you can control the tongue, then you've, you kind of got it mastered. You got life and your flesh mastered because the tongue is just that little thing that's so easy to flap around. And it's like that little spark that will start a forest fire ablaze. And just, oh, just in all these ways, it can be, remember we talked about gossiping about the gospel on Sunday? Oh, let us have these tongues be gossiping about the gospel. Instead, it's like, how quick we like, hey, did you hear about, Susan, you know, or something is like, no, tell me. And Proverbs tells us the words of gossip are like, the, or the words of a talebearer are like tasty trifles that go down to the inmost man. Tell me about him. Tell me what they did, you know? And it's like, oh, more, I got to hear it. And, and it's like, no, just guard the tongue, guard the mouth. It's a mark of the Holy Spirit in a person that begins to train that tongue um, in the things that you say. So, Guard your mouth, pre- preserve your life. Don't get lippy, all right? Um, but if you open up your mouth and just blah, 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 destruction, okay, destruction. Um, so you might just mark in your notes, James 2, 2, for the sake of time, we don't have it because it's 2 through 12 in James 3. And uh, a lot is said about the tongue there. Verse 4. The soul of a lazy man desires and has nothing, but the soul of the diligent 
shall be made rich. Um, some of the translations call this lazy man the sluggard, right? There's the proverb that's like, consider the ant, you sluggard, you know, and how the ant goes about and just works in the grass and gets its food all stored up for winter time so it can survive. I don't know the biology behind it, but, you know, uh, consider the ant. And, uh, but the sluggard, you know, they want more and more, but they'll never have it. Maybe the reason they're so covetous is because they just sit around thinking of all the stuff that they want, you know? But then even on the base things of life, like, man, I need heat in my house or I need a roof over my head. You never get it because you're not working for it. And it's a principle of the scripture that, hey, if, if you're not going to work, you're not going to eat. You know, it's just the principle of it. And so uh, within the Christian church, laziness is something that's just a mark of concern on if the work of the Holy Spirit's happening in a person's life. I think it's uh, second. I think it's First or Second Thessalonians that speaks towards that, um, and just that where there's laziness, the level of strife uh, and fighting and sin just directly goes up, and so uh, that sluggard will crave and have their appetite. It'll never be filled. Um, if you were to go back a couple chapters to Proverbs ten four, it says, "He who has a slack hand becomes poor, but the hand of the diligent." makes rich. And so, you know, I look around, I'm like, oh, I think of all the people here and like all the hardworking, you know, men and women that are here, just hardworking. I think Alabama wrote songs about you guys, you know, um, you know, this is for the one who, you know, you guys know the old country songs, right? Um, like hardworking people. Now, kids, all of you young men here, like no laziness, no slothfulness, no slug, no sluggardliness. No, I'm just kidding. This is my son. He's got like a job. He's got like two jobs. He's running track right now. He's serving. You know, it's like, all right, praise the Lord that, you know, my son's like a hardworking guy, you know, and, uh, uh, but the soul of the diligent will be made and it's the word rich or fat. Like there'll just be, there'll be plenty to fill up the cup of that person's life. Uh, five, a righteous man hates lying, but a wicked man is loathsome and comes to shame. Uh, a righteous man hates falsehood. And, and I, as I was reading this and studying it, I'm like, I just could picture a righteous man hating it when they lie. Like, oh, I hate that. Put lying lips far from me. You know, I hate it. I hate it when I lie. Where'd that come from? I, you know, I said that I said that the fish was this big when it was this big, you know, or I said that it was in the front yard when it was in the backyard, you know, or just uh, we need to care for truth as Christians. And uh, and uh, so there's a hate of when we lie, but also lying in general. And uh, verse six, righteousness guards him whose way is blameless, but wickedness overthrows the sinner. So I just want to encourage you guys towards a life that's blameless and living in a way that if people were to examine your life, there's no occasion for sin in your life. There's no opportunity for sin. You've cut the hand off that's caused you to sin. You've, you've worked that out in your discipleship where, you know, um, you know, you can examine me. The Lord can examine me. There's a blamelessness and there's security in that. Righteousness is something, it guards, it's a garrison around you when you're blameless. Um, but the opposite of that, you notice all the contrasts and there's always this word, but, but wickedness and a lack of blamelessness. And you're just always in the wrong places. You're always with the wrong people. You're always, you know, you, you have no safeguards set up on devices around your house and the dish networks and the, you know, just all these things. And it's like, you're blameful. I guess that's the opposite of blameless, blameful. <laughs> like, I'm going to blame you right now, you know? And you just be like, I'm blameless. There's like nothing. There's no way. I'm innocent. I'm justified, you know? And because uh, wickedness will overthrow the blameful sinner. And uh, Proverbs eleven three is just a good verse. I, for the sake of time, I'm gonna I'm gonna hop past it. But 
Uh, moving on, verse 7. Guys, verse 7, here's the economy of God. The world doesn't understand this, but isn't it crazy how the Lord's like, oh, the world thinks this, but it's actually like this. Check it out. There is one who makes himself rich, yet he has nothing. And then there's one who makes himself poor, yet he has great riches. That's, that's the flip-flop of the world's economy, isn't it? And you see so many people for he, who heap up for themselves riches, and yet like Luke says in chapter 12, verse 20 of the, the foolish farmer, you know, who's like, oh, um, I'm going to build bigger barns and store more crops and more stuff. I'm just going to build my kingdom and build it up and build it up and build it up. And then Jesus says, fool, you don't know that tonight your life will be required of you. You're so foolish being rich towards yourself and your worldly possessions, but you haven't been rich towards God. And how beautiful when people live a life that's rich towards the Lord and they may not have the fancy houses and the fancy cars and the fancy toys and all the sweet, you know, stuff that keeps your weekend full and fat and sassy, you know. But they've been rich towards the Lord. They've been building a king, uh, treasures in heaven. And, uh, and those do not fade away. Thieves can't break in and steal them. Moth, you know, moths won't do whatever it is that moths do, you know. And, uh, and rust won't get it creaky, you know. Uh, it's treasures in heaven. And, uh, and so that's the economy of the Lord. And so just ask the Lord in his wisdom tonight to speak into you. What ways, Lord, have I been investing in the earth, but not investing in the kingdom? Have I been investing in just pleasure, but not investing in discipleship, in people's eternal souls? Those who, uh, uh, there's a proverb that says, I think it was 10, chapter 10, Those who win souls are wise, you know? And I just think of the investment in evangelism and telling people about Jesus and and investing for people's souls to meet you in heaven. Paul says to those souls that he won, you are my joy and my crown. You're in my crown of rejoicing when I make it to heaven that day. That's great investment is evangelism, you know? Uh, Moving right along. Eight, nine, and 10. Think you can handle it? The ransom of a man's life is riches, but the poor does not hear rebuke. The light of the righteous rejoices, but the lamp of the wicked will be put out. By pride comes nothing but strife, but with the well advised is wisdom. Lots of great... uh, Great Proverbs that, you know, speak to the wicked that just seem like they'll last forever. But, you know, you think of the Third Reich and Adolf Hitler and the beast of a nation that he was forming and creating. And then it was just snuffed out in a matter of a couple years. And it's a distant memory, you know. And the wicked, they just get snuffed out and they're no more. But the righteous, they're, they're going to live forever. Their kingdom lasts forever in the Lord. Uh, But I wanted to touch mostly on verse 10 out of those three. Uh, By pride comes nothing but strife. A lot of of us are old enough to have lived a few trips around the sun. And you can think about some of the schisms. Oh, the old septic tank has reached its level. (laughs) Anybody recognize that sound? (laughs) Let's get Parks and Recs on the phone. Nope, nope. Uh, you know, anyone that's lived um, and has seen the schisms within relationships, um, the fights within even church friendships and relationships, um, divisions among families, divisions among churches, um, man, you name it, you know, there's, there's the struggle of interpersonal conflict And nine times out of ten, it boils down to that darn sin of pride, doesn't it? And and by pride comes nothing but fighting, comes nothing but strife. And I it reminds me of James 4. And it's such a good question 
asked in James 4. It's memorizable, okay? Parents, this is a good one to speak into your kids. Okay, here's the question. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Okay, where do wars and fights come from among you? Now, you'll notice how I deflected off of me and pointed towards my kids. Like, oh, you wouldn't believe my kids, you know. Kids, am I right? You know, the way they fight with each other. Because I never fight with my wife, I'll tell you that. No, my wife and I, we can get into it sometimes. We have some ugly fights. We've had some ugly fights. Even in the last few months, Lindsay and I have had ugly fight. And praise God, he's brought us to quick repentance to one another. He's good. But you know what? You can look back to those fights. You can look back to those wars. And what does it come down to? Well, James says, where do wars and fights come from among you? Listen to this. Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war within your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask, and you ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you could spend it on your pleasures. But The main thing I want to touch on there is where do wars and fights come among you? Do they not come for your desire for pleasure that war within your members? And so look at the fights among your kids and, you know, it's like, oh, like you totally interrupted my pleasure seeking that I was after. You interrupted my elevation of self, my not wanting to get off of the couch, my wanting to have the right spot in the living room. It was my turn on the video game console. I didn't want to do the dishes. I put the silverware in the dishwasher. You're supposed to put the rest in. You didn't wipe the, you know, you're mowing the lawn. You know, all of these things. Or uh, you've offended my pride or you've accused me of something or you're blaming me on that on me when you do this. And you've hurt my pride. I mean, I think, I think of many of my conflicts in my marriage and just the, the nitpick and banter that goes back and forth and just how it escalates so fast. And it's like, hey, by pride comes nothing but strife. You know, uh, you want to go ahead and try to exalt yourself? Well, I'm going to go ahead and humble you. You know, uh, you don't know that I resist the proud, do you? But I give grace to the humble. And you know, I'm so thankful for God's grace and I'm so thankful for a forgiving and merciful wife because as I go away in a huff or she goes away in a huff or we go away in a huff and usually it's her but I'll be like praying. No, no, but when I do go before the Lord and somehow the Lord brings me before him because there's times that I'm telling you I'm right on this one. Maybe none of the other ones, but this one One of our biggest fights in the years past was that for my men's discipleship group, some of the guys requested creamy peanut butter. Well, we have a whole cupboard full of chunky. Honey, if they want the creamy, they get the... No, it wasn't quite like that. But I remember, you know, there was a fight about, like, could you just get the creamy peanut butter, you know? And then it's like, Lord, I think you saw that. Just trying to make disciples here, you know? And then the Lord's like, oh, you know, and he just, and husbands listen, kids listen, I mean, wives listen, you know. Uh, In the midst of those conflicts, I mean, if you can get a jump on it, (laughs) yeah, do that, okay. But in the midst of the conflict or at at the end of the conflict and, you know, you're steaming, just go get on your knees. (laughs) Just go get before the Lord. And even if you think you're right, okay. Right, first like month of marriage, I came into Gene Stokes' office. He was our marriage pastor, and I came in and I sat down. We were both on staff together, and I sat down. He's like, "What's wrong?" And I go, "I just can't ever win." And he goes, "Don't ever win. Don't ever win. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Get down on your knees before the Lord, and say, Lord, what did I do?" What did I do? Where am I wrong? Where was I sinful? Where was I prideful? By pride comes nothing but strife. And it will not be two shakes of a goat's tail or whatever it is you guys say in Prineville. Before the Lord goes, oh, 
I'm glad you asked because here, 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 and here, and see also here. And, and then, then you can repent and you can repent before the Lord and you can be broken before the Lord and he can work brokenness to go to your spouse or to your kids. There's something big about a father humbling himself to his children and confessing his sin to them and repenting and having godly sorrow and, and being broken before them. They need to see that example. But by pride and no, I'm the man of the house and no, you know, like, like good luck on that because it just doesn't go anywhere good, okay? And man, by God's grace, you might make it to your deathbed still being married, but what kind of a marriage is that? It's not God glorifying. So uh, by pride comes nothing but strife. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Don't they just come from your desire for pleasure that wars within your members? Verse 11, wealth gained by dishonesty will be diminished, but he who gathers by labor will increase. So uh, a couple weeks ago, I went on a little vacation with my family down to Reno, Nevada. Anybody been to Reno, Nevada? Yeah. Uh, floated down the Truckee, you know, went on the water slides in Sparks, okay? And then we went to two wonderful restaurants in a casino, okay? So not been to many casinos in my life. Oh man, if you're missing the 80s, go to Reno and go in a casino because they smoke inside there. And you're like, oh, I feel like I'm at grandpa's house again, you know? But you just walk into this giant, you know, huge, on the outside, it didn't look that big. I was like, is this a Norse chuck wagon or what, you know? And you walk in and it's just massive. And have you seen the slot machines these days or whatever? They're like these big, like pod shaped, arched, uh, bling, 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 bing, 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 whatever those are called. Um, you know, those things, you know, only, and they got rid of these. Now it's like, like, that's what I'm seeing. And it was just neat, like Russell was seeing it and he's like talking to his siblings about just how empty these people are, you know. But, you know, I've heard many pastors speak about kind of the dishonest gain that it is and uh, wealth gained by, how's it put it? Well, what verse were we even on? Oh, thanks. When I was slapping the jack, black, <laughs> black jack, uh, dishon, you know, and whatever, like maybe not dishonesty, you know, throw a couple bucks in, you know, but, uh, but like you just see that, I mean, not many of those people looked like they'd hit it big, you know, it's like, you know, um, but, but he who gathers by labor will increase. So any of you slothful, young middle schoolers, high schoolers, that you think you're going to get through life just, you know, being lazy and maybe like, well, I'll just put it all on the racehorse, you know. I mean, one of these days I'll get that rich strike from the Kentucky Derby and, and you know, win it big, you know. It's like, man, go to work. Get a job. Work by labor. There'll be increase. We've been created in the image of God and God is a laborer. God worked for six days creating and working and laboring so that he had to take a day of rest because he was working so hard. This was before sin entered the world, by the way. So, man, work is something that's like created by God and something that we who are in his image get to partake of. Um, number 12, verse 12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when the desire comes, it's a tree of life. So, you know, there's a proverb in that that how many of us, we just long for that day. We you know, oh, long for the day that the Lord will come back, you know, just come back, Lord, come back. Just so hard, so homesick, you know, never been more homesick in the words of the song, you know, so homesick. Um, but also just, man, as just people, like if we've given our word that we're going to do something or make something happen and people are kind of counting on us or they're looking forward to that, like quit dilly dallying and let's, you're making someone's heart sick. In Reno, we kept mentioning to Titus, that we were going to go watch Jurassic World, you know? And, uh, but then, man, did you know that 
the Truckee River goes right by where the Donner Party ate each other. <laughs> like, I'm not driving by that without stopping for a few hours, you know. Um, oh, we can't go to it tonight, son, but we'll go after tomorrow after the water park. Did you know that at the water park, no, I'm just kidding, you know, and then we're just woo, woo, woo at the water park all day. It's like, oh man, none of us are really up for it. And just that little boy, just like, okay, just one more day. Okay, just one more day. Okay, just one. <laughs> I was like, son, come in the casino with me. Let me, look, son, you know. And so we ended up staying one more night in Sparks where you can sit in the movie theater chairs and kick your feet up, you know, and, um, and watch dinosaurs eat people, I guess. I don't know. Um, but, uh, but then just also, there's another verse coming up just about how wonderful it is when we see a hope or a dream come to pass. And so, um, you know, I think our biggest hope is what Jesus is coming. So come on, Lord. Don't, hey, hold to your word, Lord. Don't defer hope much longer. We can't wait to see you. We're homesick, Lord. Uh, verse 13, he who despises the word will be destroyed, but he who fears the commandment will be rewarded. How many people hate the word of God in our culture today or hate the scriptures? They think we're the idiots for believing in it. But, um, but those of us that do have a great fear of the word and the commandments and we love the word of God, um, it is our... Uh, it is our bread, you know, it is our manna. It's the light unto our feet and the light unto our path. Um, there's, there's great hope there for us. Uh, I just caught a whiff of Reno. You guys smell that? Mm, memories. Uh, <clears throat> uh, verse 14, the law of the wise is a fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. So verses 13 and 14, speaking about the word of God and the reward that there is there, the fountain of life that's in the word, get into the word. If you guys aren't Bible readers, get on a Bible reading plan. I'd love to point you out on that. And then heed the word and love the word and cherish the word. And the Lord will do an incredible work in your life. That's our testimony. Uh, Verse 15, good understanding gains favor, but the way of the unfaithful is hard. And so, uh, you know, as I read this, I just consider, um, man, as we're going through propositions and proposals, how good it is to understand something. Uh, we, uh, we, we had a, an exciting thing happen yesterday where we basically signed the sales papers on uh, the Polina Church. So uh, they gifted it to us, and for two years we've been working on just getting that building so that we can steward it well. And we finally signed those papers on that yesterday. And uh, yeah, pretty exciting, huh? So now we can steward that building well. But it was a two year process of working with some of the old timers from out there um, that, that value that building, you know? And so as that was being deferred, And it was just like never going anywhere. There was a man that was visiting my brother-in-law that said, Hey, Rory, think about this. Set up a meeting with some of those old timers and just ask them the history of the the area. Like find out their story about Polina and living there and like, and the church and, and, and uh, maybe what their vision was for the church and, and, you know, what do you imagine it being like in 30 years, 50 years? And, and let, me, let us pray about how we can help your vision. You know, and this guy, I don't even know if he was a believer, but he was like, you should ask him, like, what they care about about this thing. And so that was a good, wise thing for me, going into a relationship with these individuals. And, and they're telling me all these stories about, oh, we, we hooked that, uh, we, like, drug that old schoolhouse on logs with a D2 cat across Beaver Creek all the way down to Polina and you know and then the cat was submerged in water and the seat floated away and like and like they cared about all this and and so this proverb just made me think about that like as you're going into things or you've got stuff going on try to gain some understanding about it and uh, as you have understanding it says not only will you gain favor but one translation says 
you will give favor. Getting an understanding about the situation gives favor, okay? I'm reading the room. It's getting a little cold. It's getting a little dark. Um, I lost a bet and had to wear shorts and flip-flops tonight, and, and then she stayed home, so... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Verse 16, every prudent man acts with knowledge, but a fool lays open his folly. So uh, 15 and 16 could go together. Maybe you'd bracket them. Because again, we have an understanding person. Prudence speaks of someone who's, it's not like wise. It's an interesting type of wisdom. It speaks of someone who's cunning, crafty, shrewd, or sensible. Okay, now Jesus talks about a shrewd man. If you remember the story, it's in Luke 16. There was a guy that like heard through the grapevine that his boss wasn't pleased with him and that he was going to get sacked. So what did he do? He went out to everyone that owed his boss money and he said, oh, you owe my, and they haven't been paying. And he's like, oh, you owe my boss a hundred bucks. Hey, today you pay it. You can only have to pay 80. And they're like, so sweet. They pay it. You know, and then he's like, you owe 50, 30 today. And, you know, and so he gets a ton of money that his boss has been waiting on. And his boss is like, I don't know how you did it, but you're a pretty shrewd guy. And the guy kept his job. And so Jesus uses that to say, if the world is shrewd about matters like that, How much more should the sons of light be about getting the gospel out there into the world? And one missionary that I know was reaching the unreached people of Vietnam, the jungles of Vietnam, who never heard about Jesus, like deep in those jungles. And as he went on this crazy trek into the jungles of Vietnam to tell people about Jesus, he gets into this village and, you know, there's like very primitive living and dwelling. And he goes into a hut. And he finds a Coca-Cola bottle. And he's like, no! (laughs) Atlanta, Georgia. You know, the Coca-Cola bottling company from Atlanta, Georgia. And he's like, 2,000 years of our Lord saying, go to every tribe, tongue, and nation and tell people about Jesus. And we've been so lazy duffers sitting on our butt in the Coca-Cola bottling company, got their product over there, and how did they do it? Because they're shrewd. And they're sitting there in boardrooms thinking about how to make it happen. And so if you're going to be a wise man and woman, be a prudent one. Think and consider and get understanding and ultimately for the kingdom of God in these missionary ways. All right, I know you guys are like, I thought you said you were going to end this. Um, End of verse 16, just an interesting thing. But the fool lays open his folly, which means he brags about it. Like he's just bragging about the stupid things that he's done. And we've all witnessed that a time or two, or maybe even done it. 17, a wicked messenger falls into trouble, but a faithful ambassador brings health. Poverty and shame will come to him who disdain correction, but he who regards a rebuke will be honored. And so such great wisdom. It goes back to verse one, doesn't it? Just a wise son that heeds the wisdom and the correction of his father. You young ones here, I know you hate it when dad corrects you. And maybe dad doesn't always do it in a very genteel way. That's on dad. But dad still has some really good wisdom to speak into your life. So hear it. Those years, I'm a, my pastor always used to say, okay, think about like how tall you are in your, you know, 14 years or eight years or whatever. And then think about, you know, if you could put that height up for the the 50 year old dad or the 45 year old dad, like, do you see how much more wisdom there is in this experience? Like, listen to them and heed them. A wise son will receive the correction from his father. Of course, that takes us to Hebrews 12, that no correction ever seemed pleasant at the moment. But we have dads who loved us and they corrected us and it brought those peaceable fruits of righteousness. Anyone here, your dad ever corrected you? You know, my dad, I actually wear the belt now that my dad refined me with it, you know, um, has silver conchos on it, you know, uh, those are in just in case you're wondering. 
Okay, didn't wear that tonight. Um, but those peaceable fruits, Russell, you guys, when Russell was a little boy, we wondered if Beelzebub had gotten a hold of him, you know? And his head would spin around in a whole circle. And I was like, this kid, like, there's no number of spankings. Like, like he, he don't care. And I was like, he's going to be a martyr for Jesus. Like, he'll be like, what? No. Like, Jesus is the way, man. Like, what? And I'm like, okay, I'm just trusting that the Lord. And it's just funny how as the years go by, just the different personality that he has than when he was Beelzebub. And just the, like, heart for Jesus that the kid has. And he's just a man of integrity and, and work and just, oh, I love my son in case you, I owe him. So I'm pampering him here. Um. What verse were we on, guys? 25. Okay, 25. <laughs> I deserve that. I deserve that. <clears throat> okay, you asked for it. Uh, all right, yeah. Uh, a desire accomplished is sweet to the soul, but it's an abomination to fools to depart from evil. And so, now, you might read verse first verse of 19 and be like, oh, a desire accomplished is... Sweet to the soul. If we could just get the garden in this weekend. Uh, uh, have the strawberries and the sweet sugar peas or whatever. Like, yeah, that's great. That's great. But what is the contrast with in that very verse? Departing from evil, right? So the best desire that should be sweet to our soul is getting evil out of our life, all right? Um, the garden's great too, don't get me wrong. But also like, getting rid of the junk, getting rid of the sin that so easily ensnares us. That's something that if you've ever repented from sin, you, you just like, ah, like planting those sugar peas, right? Uh, verse 20, young men, listen to this. Young women, listen to this. He who walks with wise men will be wise. What's the opposite of that? A fool. He who walks with a fool will be a fool. Anybody ever just heartbroken when you watch someone that had such great potential go down that path with the fools? It is so sad. And they won't hear anything different. It's it's heartbreaking, right? Uh, The companions of fool the companion of fools will be destroyed. Verse 21, evil pursues sinners, but to the righteous good shall be repaid. So if you think you're going to go ahead and go throughout life, just live in a life of sin, be ready because evil will pursue you. Just listen to this. It's from Isaiah 47, 11. Therefore, evil shall come upon you. You shall not know from where it arises and trouble shall fall upon you. You will not be able to put it off and desolation shall come upon you suddenly, which you shall not know. So what it's just saying in Isaiah 47 is, you're going to go run after evil. Evil's going to run after you and it's going to come upon you in a way you're like, where did that even come from? And the beauty is that today we can repent of the evil, come to the cross of the Lord Jesus and find that we're in the refuge of the Lord. Uh, we have nothing to fear. Verse 22, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. And Anybody here, just you just are thankful for the grandparents before you that were kind of wise and had thought towards you in their family planning? My, my dad's like great aunt Dutch, when she died, she left me $700. I was a senior in high school. I was like, I don't even know aunt Dutch knew me, you know? She smelled like Reno. I didn't really hang out with her that much, you know? Um, and it was just such a blessing that my great aunt left me you know, and then my grandparents and their thoughtful planning and inheritances and my cousin Rhett from the men's muster, you might remember him, texted me this week and he's like, I was just looking through my gun cabinet and your dad's gun that was Grandpa Buck's gun somehow is in my safe and it's just been in here and I want to get that to you so that your son Russell can have it, you know, and uh, it was like, oh, thanks grandpa, dad and cousin Rhett, you know, And, and it's just like, what a, what a kind thing, you know, to be generous and thoughtful towards our future generations. Um, but the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. 
Much food in the fallow ground of the poor, verse 23, and for lack of justice, there's waste. What wisdom there is there that where the, there's poverty, there's actually a way to kind of start working and being creative to kind of work your way out of poverty. Like there's some ground right there. Dig a hole, plant a seed and start watering it, you know. Uh, it's just, you know, kind of a simplified way of just saying like, look around you and see how the Lord might provide to help in this labor and toil Uh, Verse 24, he who spares his rod hates his son. This kind of goes back to, I jumped ahead a little on the idea of just the spankings. But he who loves him disciplines him promptly. So not a popular message. I don't know if you know this. Not a popular message in these days and age. Uh, You know, you'll get canceled real quick, um, you know, sharing a message like this, you know. But fathers, fathers of young babies, I'm telling you right now, don't spare the rod in disciplining your child, okay? Um, in fact, do it promptly right there where it's clear that the, the sinful action has happened. Never out of anger, never in the flesh. Do it as a moment and an opportunity to promote discipleship and that the offense wasn't against you as a dad because I told you to twice, but the offense is against the Lord. And when you sin against your dad, you sin against the Lord. And that's, that's, that's where you know, the tragedy is. Um, but Proverbs has much to say on that. Chasten your son while there's hope and don't set your heart uh, on him crying. And foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but a rod of correction will drive it far from him. Don't withhold correction from a child for, there's a little New King James version here, so get ready. For if you beat him with a rod, he will not die. You shall beat him with a rod and deliver his soul from hell. Okay, this is the wisdom for fathers here. And you read Hebrews chapter 12 and you see that that the Lord, whoever the Lord loves, he corrects. And how, however many of you have had fathers who've corrected you, you've seen that it brings a beautiful fruit of righteousness. There's a lot there and we have some teachings on that online that we can point you to. And are we really there? Verse 25. The righteous eats to the satisfying of his soul but the stomach of the wicked shall be in want. Will you guys stand with me? We'll close with a song here. And Lord, we know that we have all failed in almost every one of these points in many ways from our youth till now. And we see you, Jesus, that you never failed, that one greater than Solomon is here. And that's you, Jesus. We thank you that you impart to us your righteousness and your wisdom. And we pray for that wisdom that for all the young men, young women, uh, and then those that are going through times of trial, times of conflict, times of planning for the family, times of investing, uh, times of seeking you for work and labor and, and uh, looking to the future, Lord. We pray for great wisdom that's from above, that's pure, that's peaceable, that's willing to yield, and that also bears those beautiful fruits of righteousness we've heard about tonight. We give you glory for Proverbs 13. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, everyone. Well, thank you for being here tonight. It was special, even in the wind. We'll always have this memory. Love you guys.